Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to study together, to feast together upon your word as we devote this time to you. Dear Lord, I just ask that you would take and filter out anything that is not true, that is not of you, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com, and we're back studying together in the uh, first epistle to the Thessalonians, verse by verse. In my last video, we had reached verse 8 of chapter 3. I have uh, over and over again, I've stressed, I've pointed out that this is God's Word. This is not Paul's Word. Uh, we're not looking at Paul's reasoning, Paul's logic. And folks, this is extremely important. That we not look at Scripture as only the thoughts of the writer and lose control of the fact that it's God's Word. It's what Paul wrote, but Paul wrote what God wanted written. It's not the ideas and the, the, the thoughts and the confusion of men. Paul was separated from his mother's womb, and every experience in his life was engineered by God to fit him to be one, the one to pen these words. And his concern for the Thessalonians uh, Thessalonians uh, is not really what is preeminent in our text, even though that's obviously on the surface and that's what we see. It is God's concern for the Thessalonians. And just as, as much His concern for us. Many Christians are unaware of the battle that surrounds us. Our enemy, the devil, the, the flesh, uh, our, our enemy, the world system. And these enemies, folks, they're very strong and they're very powerful. There is a constant battle between that which is against God and that which is for God. We've been privileged to be His sheep set forth uh, to commissioned, if you will, to proclaim the gospel sent among wolves and sheep have no chance whatsoever against wolves unless the shepherd's there and our shepherd's with us he's with us to the end of the age and the holy spirit is saying that our very life is vested in standing fast in the lord verse 8 standing firm in the lord now to legalists uh, that means one thing, you know, to stand fast in the Lord. Well, that, that means that we got to just try the best that we can. If we just really strive to, to keep the law and to do the law, then we're standing firm in the Lord. You know, it's a, it's a dreadful statement. Actually, it's a statement of warning against failure. That's not how I read that, folks. That's not how I read that at all. To those of us who realize that we're not under law but grace, it means quite something else. It means something different. It is marvelous truth, and, and it's the testimony of God's grace and His love that we're able to stand firm in the Lord with the emphasis on in the Lord. We stand firm in the Lord. That is His work in our lives, His ongoing work in our lives, His work in the past, present, and future, our continuing on and standing firm in the truth concerning who we are in Christ, that we've been made saints, that we, are, we stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. We go on then in, in verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God, again, for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for, for your sakes 
before our God. And that's where we're at, and that's where we will pick up here in this video. This video is a, a day late in coming. We had a, a severe thunderstorm here in southeast Oklahoma, and uh, I spent the day uh, here uh, this past day uh, cleaning up, and I uh, never have I had such uh, dance seen such damage. Our home is fine, but there's there was a lot of damage, and I spent the day cleaning that up. If it hadn't been for that, I would have had this video up a day sooner. Uh, let me take a moment to just thank every one of you who are, continue to be uh, steadfastly devoted uh, to the study uh, through these verses uh, with us. We so appreciate you, uh, appreciate your comments, your love, your support, and your prayers. So we're looking at Paul's joy and verse 9. And am, am I suggesting that this is not true of Paul? Well, of course not. Of course, Paul rejoiced in the believers at Thessalonica who were rejoicing in God. Of course he did. But that's incidental. Oklahoma's a long ways from Thessalonica. You know, we are believers in the same body as the believers at Thessalonica. And this text, folks, is thousands of years uh, written ago. But that hasn't changed the Holy Spirit's intense interest in us. His love for us, His concern for us, His work in us is unchanged over the years. Please don't look at this only as Paul's interest in the believers at Thessalonica. This is God's interest in you and in me. And it's the indication, the, it's the unbelievable truth that God rejoices with a joy that is unspeakable because of us. Think of it. You know, with all the mess in the world, with everything going on, the world being turned upside down, which it's hard not to believe, and, I, I, and I'm trying not to take off, I don't mean to, go off track here but you know this ministry's always been focused on a study of of, of his word uh, through these verse by verse studies it's the the focus is not on my focus my interest is not in in the world we're in the world but we're not of the world I have no desire no interest to talk about politics or anything else keep in mind also that that everything that's going on in the United States right now, you know, is, is well, it's just going on in the United States. Now, to a certain extent, there are global events, global changes that are taking place. There are changes that are, that are occurring on a global scale. But I just, I just want to point out the fact that there's two things that we, I think that we need to take note of here. One is America is not the center of prophecy. That's number one. Yet, nevertheless, it's relevant to prophecy. That's number two. And as and for as far as number three goes, uh, I've been meaning to point this out for several weeks now. It is hard, folks, at this point in time, not to see. Uh, not to sense uh, that there's something really out of the ordinary going on, there's something uh, exceptional, something different, something uh, it's hard to find the right adjective. It's exceptional. And for those who are, are still doubting that our Lord's return is near, then they've got some explaining to do. Uh, I think this is worth mentioning because as I was studying through the, uh, these texts, I, I happened to notice the number of times that Paul refers, makes mention of our Lord's return. And I'll talk a, bit, a little more about that. But 
His love, God's love for us, and His concern for us is eternal. And it's, I believe that we can see from the text that, that this God, this sovereign, almighty, majestic God is expressing His great concern and love for us. We, we see that and we skim the top of the surface and we see Paul's love and concern for those believers at Thessalonica and I don't doubt that. I'm trying to get you to look at at how this is God's Word, God's eternal Word message to us. It's been a long time since Thessalonica. And so, He's expressing His great concern and love for us. And not only that, verse 10, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your faith and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. God's concern isn't the election. It's not the economy, the coronavirus, and all of the things that seem to concern uh, people so much these days, even believers. God's great concern folks, is to bring to completion that which is lacking in our trust, our faith. That's His great concern. While we're concerned with all of the, the things that's going on in the world, that's His concern, His, His primary concern, His great concern. I believe that with every fiber of my being. Not not. His concern is not that statues remain erect, not the threat of war, the threat of illegal weapons in the hands of terrorists, or anything else. God's great concern is to bring to completion that which is lacking in your faith and mine. And, you know, we'll say God is in, con in control. We, we, we say that, and then in the next breath, something bad happens, and that trust seems to evaporate. I don't want to. I don't want to be unkind. When I but when I talk to Christians, they say, "Oh no, it's never God's fault. You know, it's my fault. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done that. You know, if I hadn't been there, if I hadn't done that, and if and if and if and if and I, it, all of which is saying I don't really believe God is in control. That's another reason why." We're to, to focus on things above, not on things below. God is in control, folks. I'm not saying, and, I, and, and listen to me, I'm not saying that we can't have a positive impact as far as change goes. Positive change. Okay? Even politically. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, is that our primary concern, if this is God's primary concern, it ought to be ours as well. That's what I'm saying. And I believe that the text bears that out. So we are looking first and foremost here how God feels about our trust and our rest in Him. You know, do you believe that God works everything together for your good? Do you believe He's working in you to will and to do of His good pleasure? That He's redeemed you and that, he's, he, and that he is propitiated? that He has nothing against you. God can't have anything against you because Jesus Christ died in your place. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why can't we take God at His word? That we are appointed to a life of suffering and difficulty unto you it has been granted in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. You know, we seem happy, pretty happy that Christ was willing to suffer for us. Are we so unwilling to suffer for Him? If we really trust Him, if we know that He's with us, even to the end of the age, that He'll never leave us nor forsake us, that He holds us 
in his hands, that he directs our steps. that he's working in us to will and do of his good pleasure, that he knows the way we take. If all of these things are true, why can we not simply trust him to complete or to perfect that which is lacking in our trust, in, in our faith? It's amazing, isn't it, how we trust people, we trust things. You know, you walk in a building and you sit down in a chair. Why? Because you trusted it. You trust it. How, you know, you trust that it's not going to collapse and you fall down and break a break your back or break a leg or an arm. You trust it. You trust the chair. You've always trusted the untrustable. You trust the brakes in your car. You trust the engine in your car. You trust the one who's driving the car. Otherwise, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be riding with them if you didn't. From a human standpoint, you live a life of trust in stuff that's untrustable. The car won't always be right. You know, your saddle cinch can slip or break. I trust my horse not to step in a gopher hole. We trust in so many of these things, but to trust God who doesn't change, who cannot lie, who's all-powerful, you know, seems people uh, don't trust Him very much. Why can we not trust Him with everything? God never touches you except for your, for your good. His great interest, His great interest overall, whatever the problem might be in the universe, is the completion of your faith and trust. That's what He wants for you and me. God desires intently that we trust Him. You'll never know the peace of God that passes understanding, the joy that's unspeakable, until you learn to trust Him, to really trust Him. Verse 11, now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. Paul's interested in going to Thessalonica, of course, that's all true. But if you stop there, you miss the wonderful truth that God's direction, God's purpose, and God's intent is to direct his way unto us. Just read the 23rd Psalm. When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he's there. Death being only a shadow, not a, not a tragedy. Death has no fear, no consequence, and, it, and it's not a tragedy to the one who trusts him. Is our interest to be with him commensurate with his desire to be with us? And, and remember, folks, there's a special reward for those who look for his appearing. Our aims, our desires, our ambitions seem to be centered on the on certain goals. You know, we, we is, we've established to finish that this thing or that thing, to live a life that we can enjoy as a result of all these plans that we lay out. But the great goal, our great goal is to be with Christ. For me to depart and be with Christ is much better. The Holy Spirit, as Paul say, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Do we desire to be with Him as He desires to be with us? To direct our way unto you. You also see that direction in His Word. And I don't believe you'll ever learn and know real trust in Him and real rejoicing in Him and real joy and peace, real peace in Him separate from this book. You know, I doubt if any of us have, have any idea what would happen if all, all of a sudden all the Bibles disappeared. You know, there would be so many hungry Christians. Our way to Him is made known to us in His Word. He knows the way we take. Oh, dearly beloved, our way to Him is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the revelation of Christ is this book. Ye search the Scriptures daily, for you think that in them you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me, our Lord said. This book authored by God is a revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and He longs to be with us. Stop and think about that, folks. 
Think about that for a moment. I find it absolutely astounding that every chapter in this book ends with a reference to his return. He's the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. He's the giver of the law, the fulfiller of the law. He's the prophet, priest, and king of the scriptures. He's our God. We spend time in this book that our way might be directed unto him. Verse 12, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Now, does, does Paul love the believers at Thessalonica? Well, yes. Is his concern that they increase and abound in love toward one another? Absolutely. But God is saying we increase and abound in love one toward another through His Word. If you want to know Christ, you'll find Him in this book, not in visions and dreams and, and other things. Only in this book. God's great concern is that we love one another as He loves us. We are to love one another as God loves us. So how does God love us? I think it's obvious. Love is the ultimate giving of oneself, expecting nothing in return. God's interest is in our loving one another as He loves us in the same way. And then uh, the last verse of this chapter. To the end, He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. In order that He establishes your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God. Now, if, you, if you've got your Bible, I'd like for you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, well, has He made peace through the blood of His cross? Well, the answer is a resounding yes. Remember in Romans chapter 4 and 5, He was delivered for our offenses and raised again because we are declared righteous. Then having been declared righteous, we have peace with God. He made peace through the blood of His, of his cross. God is not angry with you folks. Okay? God is not at war with you. No matter, no matter what your natural mind tends to try to tell you, God has nothing against you, folks. Ever, never does He ever have anything against you. You and I are at peace with God, but infinitely more important, He's at peace, peace with us. How did He make peace with us? The blood of His cross. It was on the cross that He reconciled us to Himself. And then verse 21 begins with, And you, if, you, if you've got a, a concordance, go through the, the and you's sometime in Scripture. He reconciled all things to Himself, in, including us, not everyone. There's, there, there's the you, and it's, it's really important stuff folks, as you study to look at personal pronouns. There's the you and the they, the we and the them, the sheep and the goat, the wheat and the tare, which is, and which is always consistent in the Word of God. It's more blunt than that. It's the children of Satan and the children of God. The children of God, you, who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind, in your mind, by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. How did he do that? In the body of his flesh by means of death, to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. And then, of course, there's, there's always the those, the they, the them. 
And, and folks, we need to take important note of these personal pronouns as we go through His Word. If you have your Bible, turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. If you continue in the faith. That's a verse that scares a lot of Christians. Well, what if I don't continue in the faith? First of all, that's a first-class condition. I've covered this in previous videos. Since you continue in the faith, and you do, the verbs there are, are, are passive. All of them are passive in this verse. You continue in the faith, grounded, settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you've heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So, suppose you don't continue in the faith. It says, since you continue in the faith, because you are not they. Now, suppose it was a third class condition. If you continue in the faith, maybe you will, maybe you won't. You may, you may not. And that's the way most people read it. If you read it that way, what you're saying, folks, is you're saying that your reconciliation is dependent upon your continuance. Okay? Look at the text. Are you reconciled? Yes. Well, if I'm now reconciled, how could I lose that reconciliation if I don't continue? Yet now are you reconciled if you continue? If you don't continue, you're not now reconciled? That doesn't make any sense. How could the present fact of my reconciliation be changed by my not continuing? Well, the answer people say is, well, you're not reconciled, but if you don't continue, you will be uh, and I've actually heard people say this, unreconciled. And that's a direct contradiction of the very words of our Lord. My sheep hear my voice, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. How long is eternal life? Can't happen. That's why it's a first class condition. You Greek students out there know that. To the end that he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God. So what did it say back there in Colossians? You who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh to present you wholly unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. By the way, is that by the way you act, the way you live, the way you, you trust, the way you think? No. Because he died in your place and he paid the debt. He's the one by whom you are justified and declared righteous. And that's what it says here in verse 13. And what's his purpose? To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father. That's exactly what he did. And that's what is being taught us in Colossians chapter 1. And then we read, At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. And it, it, it astounds me. It amazes me how many references there are to His coming in this book. Being that God is supremely sovereign, you know, try, remember there were no chapter divisions in the original texts. And yet every single chapter in this epistle ends with a reference to His coming. There were no original. There were no chapter divisions in the in the original text. So, if you look at it that way, well, it's just mentioned, you know, five times. Uh, but the way that the way that it was handed to us with the chapter d divisions, and I look at that as is also uh, an act of God's sovereignty. That, that is what He determined, that's what He willed that there be, okay? So what I'm saying is despite the fact that there were no, con no chapter divisions in the original text, we do have, nevertheless, we do have each chapter in this epistle ending with a reference to His return, and I find that amazing. 
And what's interesting is if you'll take the time, and I can't do it in this video, I'll try to pick up on that in the next one uh, as a kind of a lead in into part eight. I'll try to do that. I, I looked at that and I found that a little bit interesting. Uh, it's uh, in this particular one here, uh, right here, where we're what, where we're looking, we realize that when he appears and we are with him, we are there, wholly unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Um, so e each one of the references has some connotation attached to it. That's what I wanted you to look at. If you want to take the time to do that, uh, you'll see you'll see something really interesting. But when he appears and we are with him, we will be there with him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Why? Why? Because we're not that now and we will be then? No, no. We'll be that then because we are that now. And may the truth of that grip your heart, folks. I love you all. I truly do. I want to thank you all for your continued prayers, support, your messages, of your comments, of encouragement. Those of you who do comment on these videos, you, uh, very few of you realize just how encouraging that is to me. So I appreciate you giving back in that way. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for